some time ago in uh, attenuation, so in a radiographic X-ray image, and in the so-called differential phase contrast image that now very much resembles uh, that what uh, Cernic at some point uh, discovered. We look then at biological materials, for example, this little uh, red heart or fusion formalin, and you suddenly see how uh, much more contrast you can actually obtain through <coughs> this phase interaction with the soft tissue compared to uh, this image, which is essentially governed by the photoelectric absorption. With these nice images, of course, we asked ourselves at some point, is there a potential to, to drive this into clinics? And so, can we go from large-scale synchrotron sources with very brilliant X-ray beams like this one to actually clinically relevant X-ray tubes? And uh, the trick that we were using at that time is also a trick that we uh, learned from atom interferometry. Uh, and that essentially allows us, by cloising yet another grating in front of then an incoherent X-ray source, to simulate partially coherent X-ray beams, so line sources, which have a very narrow dimension in this direction. And this then corresponds, each one of those line sources correspond, corresponds to a spatially coherent X-ray source from a brilliant beam. And in this way, the whole setup also works again. So the basic thing that we have to do then is to place yet another grating, a third grating in front of the X-ray source. We have our object in the beam somewhere, our face grating, a reference grating, and the imaging detector. So we demonstrated this uh, in 2006 for the first time using a very prototypical setup at this time. So essentially you can see uh, some uh, mechanical components thrown together, a little face grating sitting here, another face grating sitting here, a very simple detector, just a scintillator with a mirror and a CCD and some object in the beam. And with this uh, uh, very crude setup we were able to show that you can actually uh, obtain such uh, differential X-ray phase contrast images also in a reasonable quality with the standard polychromatic X-ray tube source that we were using um, at that time. And this is one of the first examples. You see a little fish uh, image in attenuation and in this uh, phase contrast both processed out of the same data set. And if you, example, for example, look at this little uh, the lens in the eye, it's interesting to see that it actually does refract the X-ray beam, but it does not attenuate it, uh, just like it should do in the visible light uh, range. So, <coughs> with this at hand, uh, we tried, of course, many more examples, and I'll just show you one uh, that I haven't been showing for a while now. This is uh, to show the complementarity of these two signals. That's just uh, my calculator that I was using at the time. And uh, this is the radiographic image, and this is this phase contrast image. And uh, because of the fact that this essentially relies on the photoelectric absorption, which has a very high set power law, set to the power of three or four, you highlight essentially these copper uh, connections and things like that. And in the phase contrast image, you uh, don't see them uh, at all. But what you see is then uh, all the soft tissue structure, so to speak, from, from the plastic around it. So this really highlights that those two signals are indeed uh, quite complementary. Um, then um, we started to ask ourselves, uh, now, uh, can we use uh, these uh, kind of strange relief-like looking images for quantitative analysis of data? So can we use them, for example, for CT reconstruction? And the problem that we have there is that instead of measuring a normal line projection integral as you have uh, in the basic textbooks for X-ray tomography, we are now measuring the first derivative, or even worse, only one part of component of the gradient vector. So the task is to reconstruct CT images from such differential images. Uh, we also found solutions for that partially in the literature and uh, developed some algorithms to, to try this out. And one of the first examples we tried this on uh, was uh, this little uh, toy um, that I happened to have in my bag this day. So we put it in the beam, uh, uh, rotated it by 360 degree, and um, yeah, you see, of course, uh, uh, again, those differential, those gradient images, and, and then I plug it into the algorithm that I just put together very quickly, and uh, you see um, it obviously did make a halfway sense, so it did reconstruct uh, in 3D, uh, of course, there are a lot of artifacts, but it basically shows that these images are not only nice to look at, but they, they actually are uh, have quantitative value as, as the imaging signals. So uh, we moved, uh, of course, to more, uh, and this was done with just normal X-ray tube at 40 kbp, by the way. 
Um, and then we move to more biometric samples, uh, like this one. This uh, was uh, an, an infant hand that we got from some of our medical collaborators. Uh, you see on the left the attenuation projections. Uh, uh, these are essentially the, the bones and things like that. And here are the, the, these uh, face contrast projections. You can already imagine that there might be some soft, soft tissue contrast here, but if you look at the CT reconstruction, uh, this really becomes uh, quite obvious. Um, sorry for the bad windowing down here. It seems that there was a little bit of a problem in transferring from Mac to, to PowerPoint. Anyway, I think you see the basic message um, up there. Uh, these uh, tendons, for example, show, uh, due to the slightly different uh, Thompson interaction, show quite a difference to the other soft tissue. This, this black stuff, this is cartilage, and you can also see fat in, in some parts of the skin. In, in absorption or attenuation, of course, uh, the, the, the thing that highlights most are these highly mineralized parts of the sample, whereas the soft tissue, even if you scale it in a, in a different way, uh, will actually not um, be so much uh, nicely represented. So we also showed this to uh, some radiologists at that time. Uh, um, Mr. Fock uh, was working at the Inselspital in Bern in Switzerland, and he um, was looking a lot at high-resolution MR images uh, um, of um, hands and, 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 and feet, and he was actually extremely happy to, to be able to identify many of the features that he would uh, only be able to identify based on MR screen. He basically said that he has never seen such contrast in X-ray images on a human sample uh, before. Good, uh, based on these uh, initial experiments, uh, I um, was starting to think that, of course, it would be wonderful one day to go from these proof of principle experiments to, to a real clinical CT implementation and uh, True enough, uh, that's, that's a big dream and uh, is still not true yet. And there are many techni technological challenges that lie ahead of us. We have to increase the energy to a typical mean value of about 100 kV or 80 kV. We have to man uh, make a curved uh, grading structures on an arc to, to be fitted into this uh, CT gantry and things like that. All of that, I guess, is, is progressing forward, but it still, uh, still needs a little bit of development. But what we were able to do is to do a, a first step into this direction. So I got a, a grant from the European Research Council, and I'm also heavily supported by the Excellence Cluster Munich Advanced Photonics, which will be decided hopefully again this afternoon by the DFG. Uh, so with this help, we actually managed to uh, build and construct and devise the first preclinical small animal um, face contrast CT scanner uh, together with a little company uh, called Skyscan in, in Belgium, uh, which was now bought up by, by Bruker actually. And what we did is essentially we took the components of the usual small animal scanner, like um, uh, typically a 50 micron, 50 watt x-ray tube source, a little cone beam flat panel detector. We um, then uh, designed uh, three gradings into this whole thing. Uh, source grading and, and face grading behind the animal bed and uh, an absorption grading just right in front of the detector. This required to add actually another eight uh, degrees of high precision positioning uh, into this whole uh, scanner gantry because uh, that was obviously not there for normal tomography reasons. But altogether, at some point, uh, we managed to get this uh, thing together. So there are two scanners right now, one in our lab and one in the lab of this company. And we are trying to, to progress uh, both. <laughs> and uh, so here you see this, this little box. So that's sort of uh, from the outside. Uh, and uh, just to, to show you that, uh, that you actually believe me that we have implemented all the grids and everything in a rotating entry. This is a little movie. You see uh, the, the x-ray source down here in the end. This is the first grading. Here inside is the small animal bed that can be moved in from the side. Here is uh, this face grading and here is actually the detector. So this thing is working. We have also uh, not forgotten about all the small animal uh, support. So we have temperature stabilization, uh, breathing, detection based on CTDs and, and so on. So in this sense, you can, can see this as a bench to bedside uh, development, at least to, to, to mouse uh, bedside, so to speak. Yeah, um, yeah um, these are some first images, actually just two weeks ago, we've been fighting with the ethical commission for a while. 
this is uh, now a mouse in vivo image that this scanner only in radiography so far. Uh, we are not uh, fast enough to rotate the system uh, right now, but you see uh, already that uh, actually works. So here is a normal radiographic image of this mouse. You obviously see, uh, as you also expect, uh, all the bone structures and so on. But uh, and this here is the, the corresponding phase contrast image, which comes exactly out of the same data set. And you, you really see that this is definitely very complementary. So for example, you see the lung soft tissue structures, you see also trachea here and a few other structures uh, up there. So this uh, really makes us hope that uh, we can actually progress uh, quite rapidly in this direction. We were very happy when we saw this uh, two weeks ago. So uh, just to show you again that this scanner actually also works in CT and does provide this complementary information that we were hoping for. Um, this uh, is a scan of a, a little test phantom, a test phantom made out of uh, a few small plastic tubes here, um, where we filled in very well-known substances that we just know from their chemical composition, like for example water. We also placed water in the surrounding parts of the of the of the cylinder, and there's glycerol, and there's a mixture of certain certain minerals and, and salts with this water and and so, so we know, know exactly what we are putting into this, so we can also calculate. And then this uh, image here on the left uh, represents then a gray value image, as you would do in the clinics, uh, where you scale these measure, measured absorption coefficients, actually absorption coefficients, according to a small uh, formula, uh, where you take water as a, as a reference and you divide by water minus air. So this is essentially the scaling into uh, the conventional Hounsfield units that the doctors in the clinic, uh, the radiologists like, like to use at least. Now, um, of course, nothing keeps us from doing the same with the real part of the imaginary index. As I've been saying, it's all this delta value that accounts for the Thompson scattering and the phase shift of the X-ray wave. So again, we scale these images in this way and plot them in a gray scale like that. And then you, you really see that you get actually complementary gray values. If you, for example, look at uh, this part here, this ethanol uh, salt mixture, you see a very strong contrast here in phase and almost no contrast uh, as it happens here in the absorption. Of course, uh, also the other way around, in this mixture it just happens that the composition is such that it provides a lot of contrast in absorption but no contrast in phase and there are a few other things in between. So you really see that uh, uh, this is a, first of all, a quantitatively different interaction modality and that it provides a different contrast mechanism. I would, I would say it's pretty much like MR imaging where you have T1, T2 and photo density, so this is just an X-ray T2 if you, if you want to. So, so um, then uh, I, I really think that, uh, that this additional uh, uh, axis on the characterization of Hounsfield units in tissue will allow us to to separate uh, so a lot of uh, soft tissue structures that usually come to lie in the normal Hounsfield unit scaling on the order of 40 to 50, so I essentially have almost no way of discerning uh, different soft tissues unless you use uh, contrast agents. Um, the trouble is a little bit right now that uh, there are essentially no literature databases whatsoever for this delta interaction, so for the electron density that we are measuring here, because nobody has been able to measure them so far in a very quantitative way. So this is a lot of our work today where we are just trying to establish a little bit of a databases for, for the different soft tissue uh, materials. Okay, so uh, just to um, uh, show you a little bit uh, where we might be going in the future and what the uh, uh, principal potential of this interaction is. Uh, I show you again uh, two or three scans uh, that we've been doing uh, today at a, at a very brilliant X-ray source uh, under ideal conditions, uh, uh, because this is essentially the benchmark where we want to also develop our lab-based stuff to. And this is a little mouse uh, uh, scanned in micro CT mode. These are nine out of a few thousand uh, um, CT slices. And of course, you see very nicely the, the rib cage and the backbone. You see that the mouse has obviously digested some, some sand uh, uh, crumbles here. And, and, and you, you might actually start seeing some soft tissue contrast here. Now, if you switch over to the uh, phase contrast uh, CT data set, you suddenly see a very strong enhancement of the soft tissue part. Uh, for example, here, this uh, starts to be 
part of the of the heart uh, muscle. You also see arteries and veins, and if you put them side by side, I guess uh, it's a very impressive uh, demonstration of what this uh, soft tissue uh, sensitivity can do for you. So this is all without contrast agent, and you see here the blood vessel walls, for example, you see the heart muscle, you see the tissue, and, and a few other things. Um, we are also looking right now at small animal tumor models uh, to figure out where this uh, face contrast CT mode might uh, uh, give us the best diagnostic added value. And this, for example, is uh, a tumor model of the liver that's done in collaboration with uh, Professor Moltz, who is leading the clinics for radiotherapy and radio oncology at the Rechste Isa in Munich. And uh, obviously, uh, I was told that um, liver tumors are essentially hard to diagnose in normal uh, CT. So that's also why you don't see them at all in this uh, normal absorption-based CT scan. But we can actually see the borderline in some of these uh, tissue parts in the face contrast image. So uh, this is uh, starting to be some kind of uh, a very interesting development. And here is also another one. Uh, that is an example now uh, of a human patient. Of course, we cannot yet scan the full human patient, so we're just taking parts of it. And this is a little um, biopsy, or a bit larger, it's about three by three centimeter block of tissue from um, a patient who had a, a liver metastasis. This is done together with Professor Rumini at the, the radiology department at the ISA. Uh, we scanned this little liver block uh, just with normal conventional uh, actually micro CT in this case. You essentially see the, the tissue against air, but it's very hard to, to detect any details within the liver without a uh, contrast agent. This is the corresponding face contrast CT scan, and you see uh, clearly distinguished the borderline between the healthy tissue, that's the healthy part, and the, and the diseased tissue, so the, the cancerous uh, part up here, and if you also compare it to MR, you see that uh, we, we this actually confirm some of these uh, findings, but you also see that we get quite uh, some other uh, other contrast, for example, from these blood vessels, the, the walls of these blood vessels high, highlight very much. Uh, this is an image, a T1 image with a TSE sequence at 1.5 uh, Tesla. Good, uh, and uh, just, uh, I'm slowly coming to, to the end. Uh, um, but uh, before that, I'd just like to show you a few of those images here. These, um, these are images of a rat brain. Um, but uh, these are not histology images. These are actually just uh, face contrast micro CT uh, images. And uh, you, you actually see that we get uh, uh, even contrast in the brain of structures where you where you would other thalamus here and a few other things uh, where you would otherwise not see anything in a normal X-ray CT image. This is just to, to highlight the principal potential of this uh, methodology. And these little uh, white spots here are actually not artifacts. These are just the, uh, the, uh, the blood vessel network in this uh, red brain. So if we would be able one day to get this into the clinics, uh, this would of course be fantastic. But uh, this is probably a little bit uh, to go. Um, good. Now, um, with the remaining few minutes, um, I would like to actually go back to this um, very uh, sl basic slide where I try to explain to you how we process the data. And if you've been following um, um, closely, you, you, you saw that uh, I talked about uh, this value here, so this absorption value, and, and I also told you how we get out of uh, this uh, little uh, data analysis, the, the phase gradient, but uh, I've also been talking about uh, this quantity uh, um, and so as the oscillation height of the scan, but this is something we have not yet uh, been uh, using. And well, MR, MR has three uh, modalities like T1, T2, and proton density. We also need three, so uh, let's have a closer look at this A A1 here. And uh, what this actually is is, is something uh, quite uh, funny. Um, now, imagine a sample that, that actually scatters a lot, so that just diffuses the beam like a, a milk glass uh, does diffuse visible light. So if you have a dirty window, it diffuses. And the same can actually happen for x-ray. If you have a sample that is composed of microstructure density changes, 
then it diffuses the X-ray beam only a tiny amount, but this is enough to, to destroy our visibility fringe, so to speak, and essentially reduces this oscillation amplitude to a very low value. So what happens if you have a diffusing sample, then this beam oscillation height, this intensity curve height, is actually reduced. 